First up today in the growth stage competition is Deep Surface from Portland, Oregon, uh, radically automating the discovery, analysis, and prioritization of cybersecurity risks. Um, if any of you just got a text from the saying, congratulations, you paid your bill, click here to get your prize, and you click that link, you should probably pay attention. Please welcome <laughs> James Dirksen. Thanks. Thanks, John. Really appreciate you uh, inviting us to come, letting us um, take some of your time, and hope to uh, tell you a little bit about our story today. So we're deep surface. We are disrupting vulnerability management through automation. Vulnerability management is the art of figuring out what's wrong with your network and then fixing it before it becomes a breach. And there are a lot of steps to that that we're going to go through today, and we're going to talk about how we make that a lot easier. The first step is that there are a lot of what we call signal tools out in the market. So these are things like threat feeds, vulnerability scanners, network probes, things like that. And they give you a little bit of data or metadata about a vulnerability, and they, they help you think, uh, they, they give you something to think about about that, that vulnerability. Uh, those signal products are very helpful. Uh, but all of, in the end, all of that information has to be analyzed and prioritized based on what your network looks like. Those products don't know your network. They maybe know what's going on in the outside world. Uh, they maybe have a severity score that was given to them by a vendor, something like that, but they don't really know your network. They definitely don't know your users, your users' activities, your permissions, things like that. So all this analysis and prioritization is still done manually, which may come to a, as a surprise to you. So in, any enterprise company, anybody above 1,000 people, has a team of people who are internet security analysts. They look at these things and try to, try to make sense of it and tell, figure out what you should do as an organization. And the problem is getting worse. We're not, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but you've, you've probably seen headlines. We're seeing, in, uh, we're seeing a greater than 12% acceleration of published vulnerabilities every year. Currently, somebody in an enterprise company is getting 1,000 notices a month of new, new vulnerabilities that they have to work through to decide if it's important to them or not. And those people, we are, the, the supply is not keeping up with demand. There are tens of thousands of postings every month that go out for somebody who can do this kind of work. Schools don't teach this kind of work. You have to be brought in and trained up, and then people don't last very long, because this is really hard work, and it's not very rewarding. It's bottom, you're at the, the bottom of the totem pole inside the organization. Um, very busy slide, but let me just tell you how the process works. All these signal tools over on the left give you something to think about. They may give you a severity. They may tell you, uh, if you're a bank, another bank just got hacked with this, something like that. Um, then you, as a team, you see the team in the middle, they have, you have to go to your network and collect context. So you're looking for things like permissions, application configuration, user activity. Do, do people even use this application where we are? Active Directory, things like that. That all has to be manually collected. So they, they, the person stops, logs into the machine, and says, are the conditions met on that machine for this, to be, uh, for this vulner vulnerability to work? And that's called conditionality. So people check conditionality. That work per vulnerability takes between, depending on the organization, how big they are, takes between five and 12 hours per vulnerability to figure out you know, how much that vulnerability means to you. And then you have to, after you know everything that is, uh, meets conditionality, then you have to prioritize it. This is, this is a huge amount of work. Um, the, the existing processes for this are labor intensive and they're not keeping up. In the US alone, we're spending $14 billion on over 110,000 people that do this job across enterprise companies and organizations. Um, our competition, as we see it, are, is this uh, time-intensive manual process that is not keeping up. Any, if you ever talk to an organization and ask them how they're doing, they will tell you they're falling behind on this, and the threat is increasing at the same time. So the deep sur surface solution automates all of this work. We collect all the signal and context on the left. Um, we, we go to the signal tools, pull them in via API. Then we go log into every machine, collect all the context that's needed. We then analyze that in a, using a proprietary rule set where we wrote a rule for every single vulnerability that is out in the world right now. What are the conditions that have to be met for that to happen? And then we check every vulnerability on every machine. Whoops, I don't know how to go back. There we go. Uh, we then automatically model the threat. 
We know that the conditions are met, and if the conditions aren't met, we kick it off. It's false positive. You don't have to worry about it. But we know how, that the conditions are met. We look at the blast radius. That vulnerability can do what? If after it's exploited here, where are they going to go next? Hackers never hack into a database server in, in, your, in your data center. They come at the edge of the network, and they do a couple escalations. By the time they get to the data center, they already have all your passwords. They're, they're, they're showing up as administrators. You're never going to catch them. So our, but the first time people uh, interact with our product each week, they're sitting in front of a console that says, we've already checked conditionality for every machine and every vulnerability on your network. We've already prioritized it by risk. This is, this is the, usually the end result of all that work I showed you before. Then we make it easy to send these reports off to other stakeholders across the organization. Remember, the security team doesn't have the ability to fix anything. They can only make recommendations. So we give them great graphs and we show our work so they can go out and prove their case. And then we give them an easy tool to uh, export it into their patch management system uh, with all the directions for how to fix everything. So it's been great. We've been selling for about 10 months now. We're a B2B SaaS company. We've been signing up about one paying customer per month since launching, and they're at about $30,000 a piece, uh, average sale price, yearly recurring. We're trying to push that up at the end of the year to 50,000. Our customers have been great. Probably the most important thing is 100% of our customers who did the beta program last year have now converted to paying, paying customers. And we've got a whole bunch of customers in uh, the evaluation stage. And so far, no one's ever evaluated our product and not bought it, so don't jinx that. We also heard uh, just yesterday, very exciting, Dell is starting their first implementation. They've committed to an evaluation. So Dell is bigger than all of our other customers combined. We're going to build a specific team just to, to work with Dell. They have a million elements on their network, 250,000 people. They have, and they have no idea how to prioritize vulnerabilities. So we, like I said, we've uh, been Signing up about a customer a month, we're at 212 in ARR. We're hoping to finish the year at 400K. What our customers see after they implement the product is they now see this expensive manual process go away. So most of our customers put it in evaluation. They do it in parallel. They do their program and our program. They see us go much faster. Our results are done by the time they start. And then they compare the outcomes, and they see that ours are usually more accurate and definitely faster. Um, they use 80% less labor to remediate the same risk. They see their risk fall very quickly in the first year of using it because, because of the 80-20 rule. We're showing them the most risky vulnerabilities every day, and if they're working on the most risky, they're, you're going to see the vulnerability, uh, uh, their total vulnerability risk uh, metric drop very fast and then get asymptotic way down low of things they don't really care about. And they have a new capability. So this is something they could never do before. They can now measure, track, and communicate ongoing business risk due to cyber vulnerabilities. They couldn't do that before. They couldn't put a number on it. They could say, we patched this many vulnerabilities, or this is how fast we patched the vulnerability once we knew about it. But that had nothing to do with risk. They might have been patching the wrong thing. Uh, so we've got great customers. They love us. I'd be glad to introduce you to any of our customers. Uh, the general consensus is we give, we're giving them free labor. We're making them much faster. They're making them much more confident to go to their boards and go to their auditors and say, we know we're doing the right thing at the right time. Our team is, is wonderful. I've been doing cybersecurity for about 27 years. My first job was in a pentagonal-shaped building next to a trapezoidal-shaped city. And uh, this was my job at that company, at, the, at that time, in, in, that, in that building. I had to find the vulnerabilities and know what to fix. It's a terrible job. Uh, Tim Morgan is the heart and soul of our company. He's been doing this for about 18 years. Uh, he's probably the best penetration tester and application security tester on the West Coast. And Neil has done this five times before at other cybersecurity companies. I'm going to jump past financials and say we're in the middle of a $4 million raise. We have a signed term sheet from an AI and cybersecurity company in uh, cybersecurity VC in New York, and we're, we'd very much like to talk to you if you're interested. Thanks. Thanks, James. That was great. Um, I'll just kick off the questions, and I think more questions will come in on the screen. Sounds great. Um, the, uh, I think the problem's really clear with new threats coming on all the time. It feels like there's also cybersecurity companies coming into the market yep. as rapidly as there are new threats. Yep. How do you get past the noise on Well, all we've that? actually been coached by people from your team on that. It's, it's an incredibly noisy market. There are thousands of cybersecurity companies. You will never see a company in the vulnerability management space that doesn't say, 
We help you prioritize your vulnerabilities. That's what their products do. Uh, we don't do that. We don't help you. We do it for you. So we're, we're in that, very, that next stage, that huge next stage of automation where we are actually doing the analysis and prioritization. We are taking that out of the hands of, of, the, of the workers and turning them from grunt worker analysts into decision makers. Mm. So now they have to figure out that now they know what the vulnerability is and what it means to them. What are you going to do about it? And then they have a lot more time and freedom to say, what's the most cost-effective, risk-adjusted way to deal with that vulnerability? So it's a very different space. James, I'd like to talk to you about your car's warranty today. I uh, mm -hmm. just had some questions. Yeah. Um, a question from the, from the audience. When it comes to remediation of a vulnerability, does your team work on implementation, or do you hand that off to your clients? Uh, our clients do all, the, all this work. So they're providing us access to their systems. We're doing the gathering, analysis, and prioritization, and then we give that back to them with actionable information. So once they get the prioritized vulnerabilities, remember cybersecurity teams aren't allowed to touch people's machines. They don't, have, uh, they don't have the credentials to do that. They can only make recommendations. So we're empowering them to make better, more thoughtful, more data-driven recommendations. So we don't, we don't do any remediation, but neither do our customers. That's the IT team, different space. You did it. You basically cracked the code, James. That's I'm right. really pleased for you and really pleased for us. Um, so what would you say is, uh, like, how did you get to the, how did you solve this? How did you crack this code? It's Tim, our CTO. He came to me five years ago. He's an angry, hardworking, <laughs> very smart man. And he said, damn it, it should not be this way. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he's doing penetration tests constantly, application security tests constantly. He comes back every year and he finds companies just getting deeper and deeper buried in a backlog of vulnerabilities. And they don't know what to do first. And he said, it, it, we should automate this. And so he put his heads down, his head down. He only has one head. He put his head down, started working, and he just pounded out code for years, automated everything he knew in that, in that beautiful head of his, and came up with a product that does this. It, didn't, it looked terrible, <laughs> but it did the job. Yeah. And now, we've, uh, as we've hired staff, we've made it look he beautiful. He gave it a glow well. up. How much work is involved in integrating a new API, i.e. cloud computer vendor? Does your business model include professional services or pure... Uh, yeah. You know, that's above my pay grade. I, I, th yeah. This is getting to the fact that um, wh what I'm talking about here is looking at networks, and I haven't said what kind of networks, and we don't care what kind of network it is. It could be an end-user machine. It could be your on-prem network. It could be your cloud infrastructure. So every time somebody adds an element to their network, we don't care where it is, we're going to scan it and talk about its adjusted risk uh, contribution to your, to your network. And it's no work at all for a customer to integrate an API. They tell us we would like you to now start scanning this part of the network. We go do the hard work. We have an API that, inside of our product. We do the hard work of integrating so we can scan that part of their network that they're interested in. And it usually takes about a week, week and a half. And this is what we do. It's a full-time job. We do two things. Our product already works. So full-time, we do integrations with other APIs and better and better reporting so people can communicate the risk better. I am thoroughly impressed. I really am. I mean, I just, I imagine your um, time together in the office is just like sassy and a lot of fast talking. You know, I just met the team. I've only met our team twice because we started, raised our first money, and hired everybody during COVID. Wow. And I, I, I've only met the whole team twice, but we do have a whole lot of uh, Zoom calls. And are you excited? Are you all excited? Is the team just like we yeah. freaking did the, the it? Team is, the team is very excited. It's so cool. It's so great. John, do you have any other questions? I know. It's like, well, I guess. This is easy. John yeah. nailed it. There's a lot of noise out in the market. So mm. we have to out market people. We're starting to get referrals where our customers, CISOs don't last very long at companies. So our customers are starting to move on to other companies. They just bring us with them. They say, the first thing we're going to do, the cornerstone of our vulnerability program is going to be deep surface. So that's an easy sale. But they're also talking to us to, uh, to other, other CISOs. Well, James, it's such a pleasure. I'm so excited for your company. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for having awesome us. pitch. Thanks. Thank you, James. If you clicked on that link on the text, uh, James isn't going to help you. So you're going to have to figure that out on your own. Next up on the stage is the only person I know who's ever gotten kicked out of the Consumer Electronics Show. She masterfully turned that into a national press event, forcing them to change their, their, their judging criteria, and uh, made for one of the most successful consumer product launches that we've seen here in a long time. So Laura DiCarlo it creates award-winning technology empowering individuals to explore their sexuality with positivity and confidence. 
Their products are engineered using micro-robotics and patented technology designed to mimic the human touch. Please join me in welcome Ben Zoned, uh, Laura Haddock DiCarlo. Hi. So uh, let's kick this off. I wanted to know how many people here have never masturbated in your life? Raise your hand. That's great, we're on the same page because I am a huge advocate and visionary for sexual health and wellness. My name is Laura Haddock DiCarlo and the founder and CEO of Laura DiCarlo. And when I was 28 years old, I had this mind-bending orgasm that literally shook me off the side of the bed um, with a partner. And I shuddered off the side of the bed in a drooling stupor and with one leg still hitched up on the bed, literally just thinking, oh my God, how do I do that again? And how do I do it again by myself? So first off, I had no idea what the heck had just happened. It turns out that what I had experienced was a blended orgasm. Um, and I found the first mention of this blended orgasm in Women's Health magazine, and they actually called it the holy grail of orgasms. So they explained that this blended orgasm is actually when you stimulate the external clitoris and the G-spot simultaneously using partner stimulation rather than vibration. So I went looking for the product that would recreate the experience and it didn't exist. Neither did the anatomical data needed to create the product. So I started a company that would, do, that would make a product that could do just that. So where are we today? We're a mission-based brand that got its start in technology, and we're hell-bent on providing all humans the platform and space to explore their sexual health and wellness with positivity and confidence. Most of our team is headquartered here in Bend, Oregon, and I'm really proud to have our team right here today. Um, and also happy to announce that these amazing folks actually just won the Rising Star Award at the Oregon Technology Awards. Also, our innovation team just took home Fast Company's Most Innovative Team of the Year. Hey, Oregon. Before I tell you where we are today, let's take a look at where we've been. So we spent 2018 in an R&D uh, partnership with Oregon State University's College of Engineering, the top four graduate robotics program in the country. And in 2019, we were the first sexual wellness company to get a Consumer Electronics Award in robotics, for innovation in robotics. So we created a viral discussion around the importance and value of female sexual health and wellness within society. Then we pre-launched our first product, OSE, in November of that year, and we pulled in a million dollars in five hours. So since January of 2020, we've, we've transitioned from, a one, from one product to a, to a worldwide multi-product, multi-channel brand. We've launched 11 products we, that are protected by patents, seven and a half million dollars in revenue. We ship to 37 countries, and our average order value is just under $200. That's actually four times the industry average. One in five of our customers are also returning customers. So we made the impossible possible by pushing sexual health and wellness into the mainstream. We launched uh, Global Wholesale in 350 retail stores, stores like Nordstrom, Goop, Selfridges in Lus London, and yes, Best Buy. <laughs> so we created a global logistics infrastructure uh, that is supported by our three warehouses in Hong Kong, Los Angeles, and Amsterdam. And those warehouses are supplied by our outsourcing manufacturing or facilities in Oregon, China, France, and New York. The problem today is still the same problem that I had encountered when I was 28 years old. No focus on female pleasure, no technological investment, no brand recognition, and nothing that spoke to fem female physiology. Ultimately, what I saw was a fragmented market ready for global consolidation and mainstream acceptance. What I needed to understand was how well people recognized the brand of the toys that they owned, so we commissioned a study with women and people with vaginas. Yes, I said vaginas on stage. Um, and what did we find? We actually found that while females, on average, own 2.7 adult toys, there's an immense lack of brand recognition. 40% of women don't even have a clue <clears throat> as to the brand of the toy that they own. And 40% think that their brand is Adam and Eve. And that's actually a store, not a brand. So there is no brand recognition in sexual health and wellness today. This is a huge opportunity. So we provide a holistic solution 
to sexual health and wellness by aligning with what consumers actually want. We asked the same women what was important to them in a sexual wellness company. That's sexual wellness and empowerment, technology inspired by human movement, US designed, socially conscious and inclusive, and femme-led brand. Check, 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 check. Why? Because we're creating a three-tiered uh, platform approach to sexual health and wellness. One, we create products designed and engineered by women using technology innovations around robotics, material science, and, and vibration. Two, we formulate uh, sexual wellness essentials that enhance and promote everyday sexual wellness activities uh, <clears throat> for, uh, sorry, uh, for before, during, and after intimate exploration and sexual activities. Three, we actually provide online solutions for sexual wellness coaching to individuals and groups alongside content and education. So we take content and education and community, and we turn that community into customers. So today, our products actually set the standard for technology innovation. Our hero product, Osei, that big guy in the middle, um, delivers that same blended clitoral and, uh, clitoral and G spot orgasm that I experienced when I was 28 years old, followed on by five more uh, biomimetic products, our warming line, and the beginning of our consumable intimacy line. These products are award winning and they're mind blowing, but you don't have to take our word for it. Just as CES, Time Magazine, Good Housekeeping, Fast Company, and Inc., to name a few. So one thing that we all know is that sexual desire, I don't think it's going away. So we talk a lot about size in this industry. Suffice it to say, it's pretty big. And it's growing. The industry, the industry is massive. More importantly, mainstream acceptance means that large consumer product groups and retailers are recognizing that it is a profit center with opportunities that they can no longer ignore. So, like the fact that sexual wellness products like Lord Carlos account for almost uh, the most purchases, like 11.6 million searches per month in the US. And now, consumer product groups and mainstream retailers uh, have realized that sexual wellness is a profit center a significant profit center for investors. Sexual wellness is hot. It's the new pure play mainstream opportunity. So recent transactions include a $1.2 billion merger of Love Honey and Womanizer. Uh, a private equity company uh, paid 270 million US for a 60% stake in Lalo. And two of our fellow female founded Fem-led startups in sexual wellness, Dame and Maud, both raised Series A funding in four and five million dollars from respected VC. So, what does revenue look like for us? Well, in 2019, basically we did 2.7 million in pre-sales. In, uh, in 2020, we did 4.6 million, and we're going to do around five million by the end of this year. What we expect to do, though, is be a hundred million dollar company within a five years, with a time frame, with an exit time frame of three to five. So we have an amazing team, and they're gonna love talking to you after this because they are super excited about this, and they're incredible and they can execute. So they have 15, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years of experience among them and in their respective categories, and uh, yeah, come and talk to us. We love to talk about sex toys. So let's talk about competitive advantage. Um, first off, Oh, let's go. Um, our top three, uh-oh, it went too far. Well, our top three, our top three, I'm just gonna tell you, our top three competitive advantages are we have patent, patented, patented protected technology backed by a full-time engineering team here in Bend, Oregon. Um, we're the only brand that actually has an authentic human founder like this jackass right here. Um, and we have an ability to overcome advertising restrictions with, with restrictions with an A-list uh, celebrity like Cara Delevingne. Um, she's the international supermodel, actress, and activist. And since size matters, Cara is also big. With over 60 million followers across social media, Cara actually believes in Laura Carla with her own heart, so she invested her own money. She endorses our products every year, and each year she sees our products to over 30 A-list celebrities. Yeah, like Rihanna. What that means is that if you look at our global brand uh, awareness machine, we generate millions of dollars in free media exposure every single month. So let's get to the point. 
Right now, anyone can invest and be an investor in Laura DiCarlo, whether you're accredited or not. You should check that out, even you. So before I leave, I just want to ask you all, I want you to ask yourselves, who owns your pleasure? Will it be you? Thanks, Laura. And, and now for our live demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That uh, fantastic launch, fantastic start. Where you're selling products now in a bunch of new uh, retailers? Is that is, are you selling primarily on the e-commerce side or we're primarily retailer? We're about um, we're a little about 60, 40, 55, 45 um, e-commerce. D to C, and the other is wholesaling retailers. We are, you can find Laura DiCarlo in over 600 places around the world, um, whether that's a website, whether that's a wholesaler, uh, whether that's an actual retailer. So, um, and we are in 37 countries, 29 countries actually in, 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 in retailers right now. We just launched in three new countries too. As you grow from five to 25, is that gonna be DTC or is that gonna be the retailers, do you think? Um, I, I think, I think it's still going to be a pretty a decent split, probably a little bit more heavy on the on the e-commerce side, and that's kind of what we're what we're getting for. Okay. Thanks. So we have a question from. Hello. Hi. This is fun. I this love is this. just what we needed. Yes. Um, how are your products robotic, Laura? Uh, we actually utilize micro micro robotics and biomimicry. So we had a uh, partnership with Oregon State University, like I said, and we kicked off some of the. Um, uh, some of these tiny, tiny robotics that actually mimic, and that's what biomimicry is, mimic human motion. So biomimicry is mimics plant, animal, or human. In our case, we're mimicking the uh, motions of a human partner um, doing this or other things. We can talk about that later. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, all, uh, we actually have a full engineering team here in-house in Bend, Oregon. Um, and we have a full lab, uh, fast iterative prototyping abilities here in town. Um, and what's really cool about that is that instead of creating a product or dreaming up a product and then sending it out to a manufacturer and waiting for four, six, eight weeks, we can actually iterate in-house and say, I want, to take, I want to make this tiny change and then actually send it back into the machine and have another iteration within 24 to 72 hours. So we're able to rapidly iterate, prototype, and then when we're really, really close, instead of wasting a ton of time with our manufacturers, then we can send it out. That's just amazing. Your team yeah. is so awesome. Uh, let's see the next question, can we? Um, what about teledildonics? Are you planning on launching any internet connected <laughs> I products? Love it Did when, I say I that wrong? Did I just get myself fired? I had Lord no idea what that was coming. Is. Wow. <laughs> of course you do. He was the one that was like, I definitely, ma oh, she said, do not masturbate. Yeah, I thought. Um, so far, our, our approach um, is to become the holistic approach, the holistic platform for sexual health and wellness. So that's experiential, that is content and coaching, um, and interactive education and entertainment, as well as consumable products like lotions, uh, lubes, uh, pills, tinctures, that kind of thing. So right now, that is not necessarily on our on our horizon, but isn't necessarily not on our horizon. It depends on what, what the consumers want. So we actually, we, we go out and we, we survey our consumers very often. What do you want to see next? So far, that hasn't been on the top list. Yeah, you do a great job of, of speaking directly to your consumers. Who are your largest retailers? Well, um, we did just ju we did just launch with uh, Goop, and Goop is just cleaning <laughs> up, which I'll is kind of cool. Huh? I'll bet. Yeah. So um, we actually do a lot of uh, a lot of our, our retailers are in adult, um, a significant portion of them, but we are trying to push out into the mainstream spaces. So um, you saw that slide earlier. Like we're looking at like places like Spencer's. I mean, we're just going to be in Best Buy, hopefully by like I believe we're launching that today, which will be really cool if you can go into Best Buy and be like. Oh. It's so funny. I never wanted to go to Best Buy, but all that is changing. <laughs> now I know. You're like, I think I need to make that trip. You know, car stereo yeah. and an orgasm. That'll be Didn't great. Just like so many surprises coming at me right now. Um, let's see the next question. What's the biggest vulnerability or risk to your growth? 
Um, I think right now it's, it's uh, definitely supply chain, um, and everything that has happened with COVID has really impacted um, our, uh, just our ability to get all the parts and everything that we need to be able to make our products right now. Um, but we have a really, really amazing uh, director of operations, Nick, that's right down here, and he kicks ass at it, so um, he's cleaning up. So I think uh, risk averted. All right. Yeah. Okay, so protect Nick at yes, all costs. at all costs. Who are your primary competitors and how are you different? This is a great question for that you. That is a really good one because um, when I came onto the scene, it was all, it was mostly male, it was very patriarchal, the whole industry. Um, and Shocking. they were making, I know, right, making products for, <laughs> so um, actually, uh, yeah, so we have some really big competitors, like we've, uh, I think it's Wow Tech Group, Womanizer, Wevi, that, that group. But the thing that they don't have is they don't have and they don't have the authenticity, they don't have that authentic human founder. Um, they're very clearly, it's, it's purely a profit play for them. And it, it's for a lot of people, it's kind of a turnoff. Um, I think like right now, especially with the Gen Zers that are coming up right now, they wanna buy and they wanna buy into companies that actually stand for something and have authentic people that stand for something behind those companies. So, um, you know, there are some big players out there, but I think um, like a lot of big players in other industries, they're actually turning on their heels and going, how do we be more like ethically, like how do we be more ethical? How do we be more sustainable? How do we, um, how, how can we be more responsible within society and with our consumers? And it's always really obvious when you're like backpedaling, you're like, okay, I'm gonna be good now. And people right, are like, yeah, right. no. Mm -hmm. so, um, right. But then we have a couple of founders that are like, uh, it, like more in our stage, like I said, Dame and Maude. Um, but the thing is, is that there is so much differentiation within this industry that it's almost like, I mean, I'm actually friends with all of those founders because we all re realize that all ships rise with the tide and there, our products are so different, there's not a lot of competition there. Right, yeah. right. Well, and for those of us who want it to be fancy, you know, there's just not, people just aren't doing that, right? They just aren't making it look nice. And I think that, that we can't really underestimate how important that is. Well, Laura, you know, I would sit here and goof around with you all friggin' day, but do it all day I, think anyway. we, I think we covered this. So um, thank you so much. Beautiful pitch. And thank I'm you. rooting for you all the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we'd like to invite to the stage Emilio Miller Lopez from Portal. Uh, Portal is based in Eugene and is creating an innovation platform dedicated to empowering creators and giving them tools for monetizing content and building community. Welcome, Emilio. Great to see you, John. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So I'm Emilio, and I'm the founder of Portal. I've spent the last 25 years as a tech and marketing innovator at the crossroads of the experience economy and the creator economy. I've uh, produced... Come on. <laughs> uh, I have uh, produced, launched, and marketed more than 50 large-scale music and arts festivals and pop culture conventions across the United States, uh, generating millions of dollars for hundreds of thousands of fans. I'm also a musician who's toured uh, the US and Europe extensively, playing main stage music festivals in front of thousands of people. And uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about the live creator culture. Uh, the live creators are people who create live interactive experiences with their communities, musicians, performers, instructors, influencers. And uh, for my experience over the last 25 years as both a live creator and a convener of live creative culture, uh, and the experience of seeing the devaluation of live creator art by big technology companies is what sent me on the mission to create Portal. More than 50 million people around the world consider themselves to be creators. It's the fastest growing business type. More art, music, and video than ever before in history is being created right now. And yet, people are making less money than ever before online from their created content. For instance, the average Spotify artist is only making $12 a month. Now, these people were selling thousands of dollars in CDs and tracks before the streaming economy kicked in. So another example on Spotify is to make a McDonald's uh, cashier's minimum wage on Spotify, you need to, you need to stream 3.5 million tracks a year. So people turn to live streaming. They go to platforms like Facebook and YouTube, Instagram and TikTok. They go on and do a live stream event for 20,000 fans, and they get paid $40. That's one-fifth of a penny per ticket, uh, equivalently. So just think about that. You have to have 2,000 people watch your live stream just to buy a cup of coffee. It's an expensive cup of coffee. Uh, so out of desperation, creators are turning to subscription-based platforms that pay fairly well, like Twitch and OnlyFans, 
Uh, but they discover when they get on these platforms that they're uh, completely focused on video gaming content and porn and adult content. Uh, some of them are extremely overrun with misogyny, Twitch, <laughs> um, and bigotry. And, uh, and if you, when you look at Twitch, the top 100 creator channels, there's not a single musician or artist on there. So today, millions of creators around the world are looking for a powerful platform that's effective in creating equitable and regenerative revenue. Introducing Portal, the evolution of the live creator economy, an innovative creator marketplace featuring powerful tools for building live communities and empowering regenerative and equitable revenue. Portal's easy to use. You can stream straight from your browser. We have a great creator dashboard, uh, automated monthly payouts, and we have some really unique features for creators, including uh, our innovative on-screen audience, which brings the live to live streaming for the first time, as well as conference mode, which allows people to have conferences online on their channels and broadcast them to the, to the world. Uh, our portal uh, creators are able to have subscription where they can uh, control their content, put it behind a paywall that's secure, um, retract it from other platforms where they're getting no money, uh, and be able to also put on online events, which uh, are something you're not going to find on Twitch and YouTube Live. You can ticket your events, or you can put them behind the subscription wall. So there's a lot of different ways for people to make money from the platform. And uh, we have a ton of different use cases. Portal can be used for education. It can be used for entertainment or social activism. For instance, last month, we had an event with Jane Goodall where we raised enough donations to plant 300,000 trees over one weekend. The, the uh, creator market is growing super fast all around the world. The United States has millions of live creators uh, itself, and that's going to be our initial launch market. Uh, and with the uh, innovative tools for monetization we're creating, we're going to look to help exponentially grow the revenue for that market, taking it back from big tech, who is completely, I won't say, I could say screwed, I guess, after that last pitch, <laughs> has completely screwed all of the creators, used their, their uh, content to make billions for the executives and giving nothing back to the community. So our customers are the live creators and those that convene them. The festivals, conferences, conventions, networks, uh, all the folks who are part of this industry, the pandemic has not just rendered the artists uh, broken, but also the managers, the agencies, everyone is in looking right now for a new platform to bring people together. And so our, our sales funnel, the way it works is we onboard the creators, we help them bring at least say 2% of their unmonetized fans on these other platforms that pay them nothing bring them over to Portal, and we basically, all of the people that join their subscription channels also become part of Portal. It creates a network effect. It's sort of like a, a big Shopify where it's all merged into one giant store, and it's all the different creators that are cross-pollinating together to bring their fan bases into one community once again. We've already partnered with a ton of massive live creator brands. We've been the host of the last two years of Burning Man's online event. We just hosted the Shift Summit, as I mentioned, with Jane Goodall, Marianne Williams, and Deepak Chopra. Uh, and we've just done recent events with Microsoft, the Emmy Awards, Global Eclipse Festival, and more. This year has been our beta year, and we had organic growth all throughout the year. Uh, we actually spent almost nothing on marketing because we were running an agile, very lean uh, organization. And uh, yet, we brought on 110,000 members into the system, and we were actually paid for all the members that came on board because they were brought on through community events that supported great causes uh, and united people. And just in the last 30 days, we've had 20,000 new members join the platform, uh, and it continues to grow daily. So the way creators make money on Portal, um, all these creators have these, these millions of followers on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, where they're getting no money. They actually go on and do a performance on Facebook, nobody's watching, so they have to boost their post in order for people to see it, to avoid embarrassment, basically. <laughs> um, and so what, what we do is we work with the content creators, we do signing bonuses when they come on board, we bring over their community, help them to re-monetize their content and bring it into a platform where they can build a fan base that actually creates recurring revenue. So our revenue formula, we have two, two different kind of approaches we're using. We'll call them the whales and the fish. Uh, the whales, we've had a lot of them perform on Portal over the last few months. We've had about 350 different content creators on the platform who have more than 500,000 followers on social media. And uh, so again, if we monetize 2% of the first 100 creator channels at $5 a month, 
we generate $60 million in revenue. That's our phase one plan for whales. Now, the whales, they create a slipstream of, of smaller content creators. So our goal in phase one is to bring on board 5,000 of these small content creators, local instructors, musicians, chefs, people who teach, people who connect with community directly. And by bringing on 5,000 of those channels with only 100 subscribers, we generate another $30 million in revenue. So here we are at 5,100 channels and $90 million in revenue. Now you say 5,100 channels, that's a lot. Well, Twitch has 8 million channels, mostly video games, as I said earlier, and uh, OnlyFans has a million and a half channels of subscribers. So 5,100 is a pretty small lift, especially considering there's millions of live creators out there making no money. Aside from the, the subscription revenue, we also have display advertising on Portal. Um, we have tipping for the artists built into it. And we have uh, uh, also uh, e-venue revenue. And we're onboarding these large-scale events that pay us an enormous amount of money for just a few hours of time on Portal. Additionally, we also have a uh, proprietary technology we've built with Ticketmaster, Live Nation, Eventbrite, Meetup, Songkick, Bands in Town, and more that aggregates all of the live events around the world into a singular platform. Uh, called, we call it a Yelp for going out that, that's never really existed before. We have over 250,000 live creator profiles inside of that platform already, a million point six geocoded venues, and it generates millions of daily events. And we make an affiliate revenue cut from every time someone clicks through Portal to one of those event ticketing sites, we get a piece of the ticketing fee. So it's an additional source of revenue. And I'll just say also, the interactive discovery tool and the platform itself are very social. People, every user gets a profile. They have, it has pretty much all the features you'd expect from like an Instagram or Facebook. Um, so it's extremely sticky. When people come on board, they stay, they're creating profiles, and they're creating interactivity with each other. During our live events, we had over 1.6 million uh, text mess or messages between one another inside the live chats this summer. Uh, so we have high, high levels of engagement going on between the users on the platform. So real-world events are coming back, uh, and as they do, um, hybrid live events are becoming this massive revenue source, right? Justin Bieber did a New Year's Eve concert. He sold $38 million in tickets in two hours. Dead & Company are touring. They're, they're putting their content online. They're making over a million dollars a night from hybrid live events. It's a massive market. So we're building OTT apps for Portal to have a basically an interface for people to go online at their home entertainment systems and watch live creator content from all around the world. And, and basically, if you're sick of the same shows on Netflix and Hulu, um, you'd be able to watch live content right there in your home entertainment system for the first time. We have an awesome team. Uh, very experienced in startups, technology, and as I said earlier, from the entertainment industry, we're built on, on artists and creators and the people who convene them. I'm a CEO of the company. I have served as CTO for years. I'm also a code nerd. Uh, <laughs> tell I got a ponytail. Um, and uh, so, so, but we are transitioning now to bringing on more people. I'm moving into CTO. Uh, and then and inside of our team, we have uh, all these folks who've been involved in directly booking with Live Nation, AEG, William Morris Agency. We have relationships. Uh, Three or four of us have run major festivals and event companies, booked thousands of acts, and we have a great trust with these acts, who once again, everyone feels screwed by social media. Anyone who's an artist out there right now knows that Spotify, Facebook, YouTube, these companies have gutted the, the music industry. It has actually shrunk since 1999 from uh, uh, it shrunk from $25 billion industry down to $14 billion. Recently, it came back up, but the only difference in revenue is that Spotify has taken $6.5 billion a year out of the industry while giving them nothing back to the people. So, in closing, I'll just say, this year, the pandemic, or two years now, <laughs> has showed us, if anything, that the creative community around the globe needs a new platform for how they can uh, share their content, and monetize that content in ways that are equitable, regenerative. And Portal is here for that cause. Uh, we, are, we are here, our, our, our basic premise of our business is simple. The more money the creators make, the more money we put in their pockets and food on their tables, the more money Portal makes, the more, more money our investors make. And so, you know, um, basically, uh, Portal is an investment in community, connectivity, conscience, uh, and, and it is a way to come bring people back together around the art we love and the creations that we love. Right. And I'll say that um, it's, it's an investment you can be proud of. And so thank you so much for hearing me. I'm Emilio. I'm here for your questions. And uh, thanks for having me, guys. Great job, Emilio. Thank you very much.
So I, I'll kick off a question. Um, I think uh, when it comes to online events, we are all a little bit more educated than we were two years ago. Um, what are you doing in the platform to make it, to, to make events better? Like, how, what secret sauce? Because it seems to be like that's the thing that you got to yeah, figure out. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, so I'm figuring, uh, figured out. Our recent experiences with Burning Man and the Shift Summit, uh, we have really high levels of engagement from multiple demographics, uh, and we're seeing like really, like we have 63% of the people on our platform are women. Uh, whereas if you look at Twitch and these other networks, uh, Twitch is 81% males, mostly 14 to 21 years old. Um, and so, uh, so we have, we've gotten older people into using these like, live chats. And, and like I just said, millions of people are in the chats. We also have the ability to have an on-screen audience. Another feature that we're, that we're uh, integrating and going to be launching in our V2 is the ability to go live on your channel, invite your friends in to be in there with you, and then, and then broadcast that out to millions of people. Uh, there's no platform doing that right now. And so that, those are some of the special things we're, we're so adding to the So it's engagement and figuring out how we to get people have a, talking to each the other. The channel is also a marketplace. So you can actually sell your digital archives, your MP3s. Uh, this is actually banned on Twitch. Uh, we're, we're actually giving people the tools to truly monetize. This is just awesome. I, I want to ask uh, just a little bit of a piggyback question. So let's just talk about comedy shows right off the top of my head. One thing that would be amazing for online comedy shows is if you could hear the audience laughing. Is there any way to make that happen? Yeah, we actually have uh, low latency. Our streaming is uh, 500 milliseconds. Uh, and we have, we've separated the actual performer from the audience. So we have a visual audience on screen uh, with a tool for a, you basically need to have a person who's like the stage manager because otherwise you're gonna have hecklers and a lot of other terrible things probably happen on there. Um, but, uh, but we have a stage management tool so people can actually control the audience, turn on and off their volume, uh, and control bad characters inside of the, the system as well. Um, so this will be, I think, the return we're gonna see of, of live comedy in a different way um, and people being able to invite communities on to watch, and you know, if you've ever been to the comedy club in New York City, there's a line of comedians waiting to get on. Mm -hmm. So you know, we're going to have a lot of people wanting to use this and bring mm -hmm. on their audience. Yeah, I think you're right. And actually, it's interesting because we uh, have a big show that we uh, produce here at the theater. And when we started polling our audience, like, would you come to the live show or would you watch from home? It was just about 50-50. Oh, yeah, yeah, the live streaming now, it, it's just like movies, uh, premieres at home. We, people are now used to uh, the home entertainment system be becoming a way to watch live. And like I said, Bieber sold 38 million ticks. One major act should come on this platform and just blow it out. And, so, and we've built the best tool. I've seen them all. This is the best. That's so cool. Um, so they, I guess the question here would be video streaming architecture. Did you want to elaborate on what that looks like, what video streaming uh, We actually have, we have a couple different redundant systems we're using. Uh, we're working together with LivePeer and MissServer. Uh, actually, LivePeer just acquired MissServer this week. Um, so we have the ability to stream via Ethereum, and it actually, the encoding process reduces about 90% of the cost um, from normal AWS-based streaming. And so that's one, one of our um, platforms that we're using, but we also have our own Red5 scalable system uh, built into our, our digital structure on uh, DigitalOcean. That's also scalable. That's a fallback system. And then the worst possible case scenario, we have an, a Vimeo account. Well, I think what's so interesting, too, is that it allows people to choose a venue that has a lot of character but maybe can't house a great number of people because then you can make up those numbers with the live stream, right? It's yeah, amazing. that's part of what's so cool is, like, for one, um, well, a small town venue that hosts a great artist could, that only has 50 people in the room, that artist could monetize the thousands of people online if, if they don't want to go touring around, right? Another instance is like, this is a festival I love in Europe called Castle Fest. Uh, they have a lot of unique acts, medieval acts, but th none of those acts come to America. So a festival, that we're talking with Castle Fest right now, they want to do a live stream broadcast of their event to people in the United States who can't go over there and see these events. And so there's, there's so many different use cases like this. Yes, like I am never going to go to Burning Man in person, but it's on Online now, that's wild. <laughs> we're um, going to be there filming next year. We're already we're going to be broadcasting Burning Man for the first time to a global audience. Wow, so, that yeah. is really incredible. Yeah. Burning Man never. And saw by the that way, coming. they did two hundred million dollars in revenue at the last time they sold tickets. Wow. So. Um, yeah. There was just one more question up on the screen, and I don't remember what it was. Did you want to bring that back? Uh, it, I, I do remember what it was. What were the features that are the most popular with users? 
definitely, like I said, the live chat, when it comes to live streaming, I mean, if you watch Twitch events or any of these other platforms, the live chat's crazy. And, and actually, like, the ability to run slow chat, we have an AI built into our chat that uh, keeps out bad characters. Um, also, the ability to go into slow mode so that people can actually slow down the chat. Um, so, so I would say the live chat is definitely the most popular uh, feature. But I think that this ability to conference, not only with the audience, but to bring in whole conferences, we can have inside the live stream itself uh, with our technology, we can have up to about 100 people inside the live stream. So I think that that, again, is going to be a huge uh, exciting part for people going live and being able to host other people, cross-promote between their channels, uh, and create these sort of collective experiences together. Oh, this is so cool. Well, Emilio, I really appreciate you valuing the creators. Because we just hey, man, imagine that's, that's a life without for. it, right? Imagine <laughs> a life a without movement. it. This is a movement, you know, yeah, and this is right. it's going to happen. If People the need pandemic it. showed us a few things, one of them is that we, we really need our creators, right? We really do. We well, do. thank you so much. Amazing pitch, and I'm excited for you. All right, thank you all so thank much. Thank you, Emilio. I'm, I'm very intrigued by this next company. Um, Pup Pod from Hood River, Oregon, uh, is a has created a multi-species gaming platform, Human Dog. Uh, that provides dogs with software-driven positive reinforcement games and humans with a powerful tool to be a great pet parent. And I'm envisioning in my head a thing that my dog can push and I get a treat, and that's what I'm really hoping for. But I, I, we'll see what happens. So welcome to the stage, Eric Idas. <clears throat> We're going to have a little demo for you, so let's just set that up. <laughs> so hi, my name is Eric Idis. I'm the CEO and co-founder of PupPod, and we built the world's first multi-species gaming platform for lonely and bored dogs that are out there. Um, there we go. Oops. There we go. So let me see a quick show of hands. How many people here have a dog? OK, you guys are part of the 67 million households in the US that have at least one dog. And um, oops. You're jumping around. This isn't uh, there we go. Um, and with COVID, there was a huge uptick in dogs uh, in dog adoptions. And now that the pandemic is starting to unwind, separation anxiety is becoming a really big issue. And out of those 67 or 69 million households that have a dog, almost a third of them are at home alone for most of the day. And pet parents, they want a solution to this. They feel really guilty when their dog's left home alone throughout the day, and so they're looking for other options. And the most common option is to send their dogs to daycare or to get a dog walker. And they're spending hundreds of dollars a month with this solution, but it's really expensive and it's labor intensive. And so we've got a better idea. Now, as most new ideas, they come from personal experience and your background. And uh, this was my first dog, Puccini. And he would bark at dogs on TV all the time. We saw him on TV. But one day, we're watching a cartoon, and he starts barking at a cartoon dog. And it got me thinking, what is going on in his brain? And in hindsight, there was a lot more than I even realized. Now, my experience building the early smartphone devices at Motorola and at Microsoft allowed me to experience building a big new product category. And I was seeing people use tablets and smartphones to entertain their kids, and I thought, why can't we bring technology to the, to the world to help pet parents? Um, and so it became obvious to me that there was going to be this new big product category that didn't exist yet, for smart and connected pet products. There we go. Um, so we started building Pup Pod. And uh, pets, pet parents can play with their dogs and their pets from anywhere. And the pets aren't sitting home bored all day. They're able to have the mental stimulation that they crave. Now, what we're also betting on is that the consumer preferences for buying pet products are going to shift from buying pieces of plastic that have no technology or stuffed animals to these smart, connected 
pet products. And when that occurs, the whole industry is going to need a platform to connect to. And that's where PutPod comes in, longer term. It's a big vision to build a big company. Now, over the next few years, millennials and Gen Zs are going to be 60% of pet parents. And it's not a big leap to see that they're going to want to look for technology solutions in order to meet the needs of their pets and be great pet parents. So let me give you a quick video, and we'll show you a little bit how PutPod works. So in the beginning, the dog just has to go and touch the toy, the toy up here on stage. And um, when they touch the toy at the right time, they earn food rewards from a connected feeder. And you can control the whole game from your smartphone. And we use a combination of lights and sounds and timing to create this puzzle that gets incrementally harder as the dog learns. So the dog's not going to get bored. The pup, when you see Ollie come out, he's been playing for over four and a half years. And the game can keep getting more challenging, and we can keep rolling out new features. And we've already rolled out multiple updates to the feeder and the toy software to keep bringing out new functionality. And this is just the first product in our roadmap. Now, when we, as we become more and more successful, we're going to see people come, competitors come and try to copy us. So we have a very deep moat to protect our competitive advantages. Now, being first to market allows PupPod to get that mental space for this category. But we've also won innovation awards from Purina and from the Kansas City Animal Health Investment Forum uh, because of the innovation that we brought to market. Now, we've worked with hundreds of dog trainers and pet professionals, and they love this product. They love to recommend it to their clients because they all believe in puzzle toys. They love to use puzzle toys for feeding meals, and they see Pot as the future of puzzle games. As part of the funding from our current round, we're going to be building out more community and more competitive features over the next year, which are really going to drive viral adoption. And we're already bringing more science-based games and cognition into the product. Uh, we're already building some new levels that are based on a partnership we have with the University of Arizona's Canine Cognition Center to bring in more science and, pup, and associate the PupPod brand with science. Now, today, we're selling the hardware. We make revenue from selling hardware. But as part of our current funding round, we're also going to be rolling out a subscription feature. So like lots of other products you use, there's going to be a subscription for new digital services. And we're also in the process of signing up our first licensee to the platform, which is a really capital efficient way to grow the number of uh, users on the platform. And so our business model looks a lot like Xbox, where uh, Microsoft sells first party games, and they also have a, a subscription service like Xbox Live for all the community, and then they license out access to third parties. So we're doing, we're doing a lot of those same pieces to the formula. Now, while there's other pet products out there trying to come into this space, nobody comes close to us in terms of the features that we provide and the functionality and the price point. And we've had some amazing traction. We started selling this version of the product back in a holiday of last year, and we've already sold over 1,500 units to customers, and those customers have generated over 1.6 million minutes of gameplay. They're using the product a lot. Uh, we had 67% of the customers active in September. And for our average customers, they're using the product for 32 minutes a day. And it's really hard to get that kind of um, interest in people's lives, for them to start using a product for that much. Now, if um, you see on the chart here where the sales shoot straight up, that was when we had a video go viral on TikTok, and our sales literally went up 10x overnight. So we know that when there's awareness, there's demand. When we drive awareness, there's demand. Now, we believe that PupPod can get to $80 million in sales and a $25 million uh, EBITDA in the next five years. Um, we've raised $1.3 million to date, and we're raising a $5 million round now, mainly for sales and marketing, which we'll use in part to, buy, to, to hire a CMO, to develop our marketing framework, to add new channels, and to expand um, our affiliate program that's working really well. And the team that's bringing, whoops, and the team that's bringing all this technology to market are a group of seasoned technology experts from, who had a lot of our career at Microsoft, as well as Dr. Mugford, uh, who's one of our uh, strategic investors. 
And so Candarp and Aman and I have all shipped products, consumer electronics, uh, software platforms that have scaled to hundreds of millions of users with our time at Microsoft. And Dr. Mugford has been selling pet products and inventing pet products for the last 40 years. So with that, let me invite Rachel and Ali out on stage, and we will uh, give you a little demo. I'm happy to answer questions while, uh, while Ali's giving us a demo. <laughs> hey there. All right, you win. <laughs> I do have to apologize for whoever follows me because it's hard to follow, follow Ollie. All right, so I just started the game, and um, he's, hey, come on, come here, come on. You got you to do your job. <laughs> so uh, when Ollie hears the toy make, some, make a noise, he'll hit the toy, and then he gets a reward. And so he's waiting for the toy. The, every 10 seconds, the toy will play a little squeaky sound, which may be a little hard to hear <laughs> in the back. And he knows that when the toy, he doesn't need to hit the toy until it makes the sound because he's been playing for so long. So we put it at, at another level. But in the beginning, a dog just comes out and just touches the toy, and then they start learning the connection between the toy and the feeder. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so this is a. So this is a platform that you could make, people could make additional games on top of? Exactly, yeah. So, so I could get one to the dog would give me a treat. What's that? I could make one where I could get the treat from the dog. Well, we have multiplayer games <laughs> where humans and dogs can play together, dogs and cats can play together, multiple dogs can play together. This is really the beginning of a multi-species gaming platform. Have you ever had, uh, I'm going to say a client, a canine client, like attack the biscuit machine and like try to get all the biscuits out? So that's a very easy problem for a human to avoid from happening. There's a hooks on the back of the feeder, and you can just mount it on a wall. You can put it up on a high shelf. I would definitely have to do that. I have a very, very <laughs> hungry golden at home right now. Wow, this is so special. I mean, if I had a nickel for every time I say I need to buy my dog a cell phone, I'd be a venture capitalist, quite <laughs> honestly. This is, I've been waiting for something like this for a long time. So usage statistics based on human or dog interaction, great question. Are those usage, usage statistics that you talked about, are those the human usage minutes or dog usage minutes? So we're tracking everything in the system. It's an IoT cloud platform. We know every time the toy makes a beep, we know every time the dog touches a toy, we know every time a food, a food reward is dispensed, we know how dogs are, are um, progressing through the different cognition challenges in the game. <laughs> and so for all of you that put your hand up because you had a dog, now you know what you're gonna do tonight when you go home after, after another uh, drink and go buy a pup pod. And for anyone who didn't raise their hand, now you know what you're going to get your friends for the holidays. I'm pretty yeah, sure you're the dogs. best usage statistics of any app anywhere. No the kidding. Dogs are going to just sit there no kidding. For it. So how does this situation relate to cats? Now that's a whole other world. <laughs> oh, we have cats that play too. We've had pigs, chickens, horses, any kind, any animal that um, can be clicker trained can play the game. Yeah, if you go on our Facebook page, you'll see. Uh, video we posted just last week with the cats playing. Okay, and so you're, you're making this happen, so he's not gonna like go through the whole thing of biscuits. Is that right? Uh, I just turned the game on. I can oh, make okay. it more difficult from my phone. I can increase the level, and then at other levels of the game, it's not this simple. My retriever but, would be 192 pounds by Friday, like well, next week. So, <laughs> so here's, here's what we advise people is you want to feed your dog a normal meal. This is just his kibble that he's working for. So rather than your dog eating their meal out of a bowl and then passing out, now they're getting activity. And in our living room, Ollie would walk about a mile at each meal. So now your dog's eating the same calories they would normally eat, but they're getting extra exercise and mental stimulation. Wow. <laughs> wow. OK, are there any other rewards besides food? Would like. Like, uh, I, I don't know. I'm like, what could that be? There, there, there are other things in our roadmap, some of them in our, our patent, but food is the, obvious, is the obvious one, so that's where we started. It's like scented soaps or like what? <laughs> well, um, yeah, there's, food, is the mo food is the most encouraging one, but there are some dogs that don't, uh, and animals that aren't as food motivated, so there's other ideas. Uh, I won't 
release them all in a public forum, but there are other ideas besides food rewards that we have planned. Um, can you see Pup Pop moving into training, Pup Dog Training, maybe fueled by AI? Yeah, so we work actually very closely with dog trainers because dog trainers really like this kind of product when people go home. Um, Ollie's level of concentration is off the chart you know, by, from playing this game from so much. And so what dog trainers love is that a dog that's eating their meals this way is much more trainable because they can concentrate for much longer amongst a bunch of other, other scenarios. It's also, dog trainers will use this for like separation anxiety, weight reduction, um, giving your dog more um, mental stimulation so they're not bored, not getting into trouble. There's a whole bunch of behavioral benefits when the dogs are just tired, when they get a good workout. My dog ate, uh, he stayed with some caretakers last week, he ate all of the tortillas and all of the bread when they left him alone. There was some separation anxiety. I really wish I had this yeah. for them. They were like, well, we had an issue. I'm like, I told you he was gonna do that, but <laughs> wow. So, and are then um, what about like um, when you're mobile, like when you're out uh, walking around, can, can this, is this something that could become like usable like out on the trail or? Um, I mean, it's really meant for when your dog's at home. What we do find is that a lot of people who are working from home will let their dogs earn their meals when they're in Zoom calls because as the other person on the end of your Zoom call thinks the Zoom call is much more interesting than your dog does. So if you've gotten that cold nose poke you in the elbow when you're on calls all day, this is the solution for that, that problem too. Absolutely. Okay, I want to ask this question because I'm curious about the answer. Do you have a solution for someone who has two dogs? Oh, yeah. As long as the dogs don't have any food aggression or resource guarding, they can play together. And you will see fascinating communication between your dogs when they start playing the game together. And in some cases, people will let their dogs play one at a time, and that lets one dog learn patience while the other dog is playing. So it's, it's, it, it's in a multi-dog household. It's like doubles household. volleyball. And we have future games coming out that will be for multiple dogs. So that pack mentality of the dogs working together We'll be able to deliver games that you know leverage that that in inherent capability too. Wow. Well, I just think this is so special, and partly it's because I'm obsessed with dogs, and you really won me over with Ollie. So, thank you so much. This is awesome, and I'm wishing you the best of luck. And thank you. I look forward Thanks, to you guys sir. all being customers. Good job, Ollie. Please welcome uh, Nathan Nathan Helming, Helming with the Run Experience to the stage. Uh, from right here in Bend, Oregon. Uh, the Run Experience is a daily fitness app with audio runs and trading programs designed to build a healthy running habit. One running habit that I know is to never run behind cars. <laughs> you, you, you get exhausted. <laughs> so for good. those of you that have come here in the past, that's for Eric Rosenfeld right there. Okay. Uh, next slide. So, I started out running and mountain biking a ton. It's probably what drew me to Bend eventually. And the more I got into it, the more uh, injuries I came across. Uh, it wasn't really until I got knocked out of the Berlin Marathon, the Boston Marathon, and the Kona Ironman World Championships that I realized that I had to maybe rethink my approach to running, and maybe running in general had to rethink approach to running. We've been doing this potentially wrong and backwards. So I went down a deep rabbit hole for the last 10 plus years, diving into strength and conditioning, into run form and mechanics, into the best recovery practices out there. And I discovered there's actually a lot that we could all do ourselves to make ourselves stronger and healthier. I started sharing them initially with shaky, uh, unedited iPhone videos to YouTube. And while the editing wasn't great, the traction started to happen. Next slide. So fast forward to today. Uh, we have the largest running channel on YouTube with over 545,000 subscribers. We have six creators all over the world. This image, my designer went nuts putting it together, but it's literally the 1,000 plus uh, thumbnails of all the videos we've put up uh, thus far. And every month, our runners consume 65,000 hours, or the equivalent of seven and a half years of our helpful, empowering running training content. Next slide. And Next slide. <laughs> and, you know, we learned a few things with runners here, right? There's a real love-hate relationship with running. On the left side, we call it the gateway drug for fitness. It's easy if you're intimidated to go to the gym. You can go outside. It's super COVID-friendly, we figured out. Uh, your bike's in the shop because this is Bend. You know, you can go out and do that. 
The numbers speak to it. 60 plus million people in the United States participate in some form of running, jogging, and walking. That's 15 plus percent of the population. Super home and digital friendly. And we started making programs for these guys and gals with the crazy bumper stickers on the cars, right? They're the self-identified capital R runners that are just super into it and are racing a lot. And we realized there's about 7 million of them, so that's where we targeted. Next slide. But we also realized that people have the hate side of running as well. First of all, not everyone is that super motivated capital R runner. There's 53 million casual what I call lowercase r runners out there, who are just trying to run with their kids. Maybe they're training for a team sport, maybe they were late to practice, maybe it shows up in their Barry's Boot Camp or the CrossFit class. And yes, running can be a little boring sometimes, we can fix that. Uh, it can feel a little painful in the body, but the biggest issue is injuries. Every single year, 50 plus percent of runners are going to experience an injury or another, and these are really conservative estimates. When I was running around before Kona trying to salvage my experience, I was going to get extra uh, massage. I was going to see physical therapists. I was looking at different shoes to wear. I don't know if any of you woke up one day and said, hey, I got nothing going on. I would love to get a cortisone shot. Does it really happen? I was in my orthopedist getting one in my hamstring. It didn't feel great. Studies show that the average injury costs over $200. And if you put this together, this is a $6.1 billion problem for something that's supposed to be making us healthy. Next slide. So in the past, I called it the fridge plan or also the hope and pray plan. We would take our running plans, tape them to our fridge, they would have the mileage, and you'd just start to run, kind of hoping that you can keep up with the mileage without anything going wrong. But then those pains start to come in, and you don't really have anything to do, either stop or to keep running. So you keep running, just praying that the pain goes away on itself. When we look at the present digital fitness landscape, you know, we've really doubled down on motivation and community. So when your IT band hurts, you got this really motivational person saying, keep going, you're doing great. And you're like, well, should I stretch my calf? Should I change my run form? You're like, one more mile, you know, keep going. And we've connected you with other people. We've added leaderboards. All of these things are super fun and engaging. But this really fun video that's not playing is really what the future is where we're actually giving runners deep, technical, empowering coaching and help on how to take care of their bodies and how to run. And I think that's what we all deserve. Next slide, please. There we go. So this is what the daily run looks like. Now, we realize that there are these two types of runners. There's the capital R, motivated. They want longer programs, 5K to marathon. We started off with those, but we realized we were missing out with our lowercase r runners, and we realized we needed a headspace style solution for them. I like to meditate every once in a while, but I don't go on five day silent retreats. I just like a little 10 minute thing every single day. So I started releasing 10 minute audio runs that take you through a breathing exercise or a run form drill, an easy win that makes you actually feel like you're getting better at this. Uh, we do technical coaching on how to actually make you better with it rather than just suggesting a little warm up or pre or post run stretching. We guide you through it. Coach Nordog's in the video sometimes, you get to see her. And then we actually have an injured runner program in the app, coded by body part and by injury level. So you can stay in and stay together and not just have to bounce out. Next slide, please. So, you can download the app. If you don't really know where to start, within two taps, you're doing the new daily run workout, or you're going to do the daily strength that day, or the daily recovery session that day, because I don't believe we should necessarily run seven days in a row, or we at least should have the option not to. Uh, you could also go into one of our longer programs. We do monthly challenges to engage the community, get you focused on something, whether it's nutrition or a specific running distance or skill. You can talk directly to our awesome team of coaches and connect with each other uh, all right in the app. Next slide, please. And look, we're already starting to see some great traction here. Since we've launched, we have 107,000 total users, 12K monthly actives, 1K da daily actives who are planning their next workout, they're doing their workout, they're talking to coaches, and they're talking to each other. Our revenue is up as well. Next slide, please. And look, it wouldn't be the fitness world if it wasn't competitive. I could put a whole bunch of companies up there. I'm sure you could think of a bunch there. But when I really look at the leaders in the running space, I look at Nike Run Club and Peloton. 
And look, we bootstrapped, we cut our teeth by going deeper than other companies were willing to go and empowering runners to take care of their own bodies, to improve their own run form. And with this fundraise, we know we're going to improve our user interface and compete at a higher world-class level. Next slide. And this is where I get really excited about this, because when I ask someone to run, I'm not just asking them to start a training plan. I'm also asking them to get a pair of shoes. I'm asking them to get apparel. Maybe they're going to sign up for a race. An average runner spends over $1,000 a year. $350 of that on shoes alone. We have watches. We've got aura rings and whoop bands. We want to know what that data does. And we think we can move beyond training and into training and gear subscription models, where we're starting to send the apparel uh, Cairn style to you in addition to your running habit. Uh, and these little brands in the background are brands we've already partnered with on our YouTube channel, like Strava, Nike, Bose, uh, Reebok. I write regularly for Trathlete Magazine. Uh, and uh, we've partnered with the SF Marathon in the past for coaching. Next slide. We have the team to do it. Uh, you know my story a little bit. Um, I am making the thing that I wish I had when I was 15, that honestly I wish all of your kids have when they start training themselves. Uh, Rick is our dev partner. He's incredible experience working and building my fitness on, uh, on projects like my fitness pal. Craig is my co-founder. He ran in college previous successful exits in the mobile gaming space, so he knows the startup world really well. Next slide. And you know, this year we have about 3,500 paying members to date on a $20 a month and $120 uh, annual subscription. Uh, we're set to make about half a million in revenue, so I'm here to raise $2 million to really get us to that next level where we think we can hit a $5 million ARR in about two years' time. We're breaking it down into three stages. Our first stage is we just want to continue to iterate and build and improve the feature set that complements the coaching and content that we're already able to provide. Stage two is going to scale by really personalizing that experience for every single runner. It's not always about having a super long and huge library. It's about getting the right workout, the right exercise served to you in the time that you need it. And then stage three is going to be expanding into other types of products and big brand partnerships. Next slide, please. So look, we've got this hard-earned reputation in the running space. We have a solid head start on a training subscription business with a ton of upside getting into the other bites of the apple that runners are all looking for. We've already been called the holy grail of running, training, and accountability apps. And we're just getting started, and we're looking for investors and partners to join us and keep the world running strong and healthy. Thank you. Nathan, thanks, thanks so much. Great presentation. Um, that's a pretty impressive start for, a, for an app for $20 a month for 3,500 people. That's a, that's a very impressive start. How, how do you go get customers? But you're still in an, in an app world. You're still in an app world with fitness apps and lots of competition. How do you get those customers going forward? How do you get from where you are today to the sure. next level? So when I think of like a training relationship, it's really on trust. It's not a commodity. People aren't choosing to read one book because it's a dollar cheaper than the other book. They're, they're thinking, I'm going to spend a couple weeks with this. I want to make sure it's right. And when I download you know, a, a book on my Kindle, I'm a little nervous. I'm like, I want to read the reviews. I want to make sure it's right. So we build that trusted relationship on YouTube. We have a lot of our viewers who've watched several videos with us. They've seen me. They've seen other coaches. They've tried some of our things. And then they've started to build that awareness of our, of our app. So then all of a sudden, when we're launching a new challenge, they convert income in that way. Okay. Is there any sort of social component to this? Yeah, there's a huge social component. If I had another eight minutes, I could totally go into just that whole piece by itself. Um, when we put this thing together initially, it was you know, duct taped together with a WordPress website, uh, Vimeo videos, and a Facebook group. And we were so product focused at the time that the Facebook group was an afterthought. But what we quickly realized is while people came in to solve a specific problem, they stayed for each other. And actually, just a couple weeks ago, we hosted a Bend uh, running retreat. We did the Bend Beer Chase, partnered with Cascade Lakes Relays and Scott Douglas locally. Uh, and we had some of our runners fly in and, and do it, some of which who had been training with us for five plus years. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. So does this, I like this question, does this pair with a smartwatch, do you anticipate moving into other fitness areas like bikes, swim, et cetera? So 
I have a passion for all things endurance. Like I grew up mountain bike racing, uh, got into triathlon, and so when we were originally thinking about where we could go, you know, the run experience could really be the X experience, right? We could go with triathlon, the bike experience, et cetera. But right now, it seems smart to just focus on the running. Uh, so we're really kind of staying there to just really own and go as deep as we can in, in that vertical. Uh, yeah, we absolutely see a future where you can download the audio workouts to your watch. A lot of runners don't want to run with their phone, right? So we just want to make the experience as seamless and intuitive as possible. I don't even want to walk with my phone, Nathan. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say about that. I don't want a phone at all. I don't even know? want it. Yeah, I know. Can we see that? Thank you. This app is for me, walk or run me through, <laughs> how it would help me protect my knees. Sure. So there's a lot of scientific research-backed support on things that we can do to minimize impact on our running. Believe it or not, it's actually not wearing thicker shoes. That doesn't always help. Studies actually show that when you wear your super thick shoes, your body's trying to find stability, so you start striking the ground even harder. One of the things you can do is learn how to stabilize yourself here. You can breathe better, and the best one is improve your cadence. So we actually do audio workouts. One of the first workouts you do, if you guys download and do your first three runs, I believe it's the third workout, is a cadence where we use a little metronome to get you to pick up your feet to a certain rhythm, and all of a sudden you're running lighter. This is awesome. It's really well done. Let's see the next question. Um, other than content, how do, your, how do you differentiate from other fitness apps and brands? So... It's a great question, right? And it's really the big one. I think the way that I, the way that I like to answer this is, you know, YouTube is, uh, is pretty tough and competitive. It's one of the only social media platforms with a thumbs down vote, if you think about it. Uh, they are so vicious on retention that if you have a video up there that ends a viewer's uh, you know, time on YouTube, they deprecate your video very, very quickly. You can't buy it either, right? So we just have this head start in the YouTube space with this big trusted platform, and we did it, and we know content, and we know retention. So I think for us, we've just gone deeper. Our YouTube kind of shows that we have that sort of legitimacy. But yeah, we always are gonna need to be thinking about what the next best experience is going to be for runners. So it's not just, hey, we're big enough right now, so we're sitting where we are. That's why I'm here to raise money, because I want to deliver that next level of experienced runners. So this question is a little bit obscure. I, you know, we both kind of joke around that we don't want a phone. We're joking, not joking, right? So as user uh, behavior changes, I don't, I, do you have any thoughts on like how we're going to be in 5, 10, 20 years with our devices? It's a good question. I think that we are all looking for technology to empower the natural human things that we want to do. I think Apple did a great job by making a device, you're not having to type in command prompts, but by being able to touch and swipe and move. And I think with our running and when we look at our devices, there's just going to be a natural marriage. You know, I see right now we have a lot of wearable tech and we have all this data, but we actually don't know what to do with all these numbers that are yelling at us. And I see a world where we can kind of integrate that data into the coaching experience and then the coaching experience can change your training output just like you would talking to a real coach. Hey, coach, I didn't really sleep well the last couple of nights. I was tired. I was stressed getting ready for the BBC competition. They're like, hey, maybe take it easy tomorrow. But that just kind of automates and shows up in your workouts. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Nathan. I'm excited for you guys. It makes me want to run. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank I you. Hi. We give you Woo. a big, you get a thumbs up. Woo. <laughs>